Top Mate Talk. Hi, it's Monty Mython here, Editor-in-Chief of Top Mate Talk. Well, these are extraordinary times. Despite all the challenges we face, we will continue to deliver free, open-access medical education for as long as we can manage it, as well as our new regular updates on COVID-19, the global pandemic of coronavirus, reporting from the front line, we'll be concentrating on enhanced surgical recovery. Why have we made that decision? Well, with an unprecedented pressure on resources, many institutions have decided to accelerate their widespread adoption of enhanced recovery. And why? Well, it's never been a more important time to reduce complications, readmissions, avoidable ITU bed occupancy, and to get our patients home fitter and faster after major surgery. As somebody who's about to get back into the trenches in critical care, to all my surgical, anesthesia and perioperative care practitioners, thank you for making this a priority. A big shout out to our sponsors, in particular Edwards Life Sciences, who have very generously agreed to continue to support this resource, that's Top Med Talk, at a time of global need. We're all in this together. We will get through it. It's going to be fine. I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, Sara Ruane. If I say it well, yeah, thank you, okay. Uh, Sarah is currently uh, Sports England's national lead for health, um, and she led extensive transformation and investment programs in preventative health. So, Sarah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind invitation today. Um, so, I'm Sarah Wayne. I see the health uh, and activity work of Sport England. Um, today, I just wanted to talk through or wanted to pose um, moving as medicine. Is it the most underused but proven health promotion and healthcare practice? So, just have that in the back of your mind. Um, first of all, to set the scene a little bit of why Sport England are interested in this, um, this is really at the heart of our vision, um, which is that we want everybody in England, regardless of their age, level of ability, background, to feel able and able to engage in sport and physical activity. Some will be young, fit and talented, but most will not. We need a sports sector that welcomes everyone, meets their needs, treats them as individuals and values them as customers. So... At the heart of this is our belief that people disproportionately impacted by the barriers of physical activity deserve an equal opportunity to take part and get the benefits um, being active can bring. The challenge that we face in England, however, is that a quarter of the population are currently inactive. So that means they're doing less than 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. Um, And there is also strong evidence that they're also not meeting the other CMO Um, physical activity guidelines such as strength and balance Um, so when we put that into context so that's 0.30 minutes is just 0.3% of a person's week so we have a quarter of the population not meeting that 30 even getting to a 30 minute um, threshold um, and even less um, meeting the CMO guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week Um, even more shocking is that the average of 25% is actually um, mass and very stark inequalities with subgroups of the population who are significantly less active than others. Um, You're two times more likely to be inactive if you're over the age of 55 compared to if you're under. Um, And um, an example here of those with a disability, uh, so an impairment or they've self-reported as having an illness or, or health condition, are also two times more likely to be inactive. So this speaks directly to our mission to address this injustice and transform sport and physical activity so people everywhere, um, regardless um, of their background, can benefit equally. So why does that matter? Why does that matter to our health in particular? Um, Physical activity, as hopefully all of you guys know, um, plays an absolutely fundamental role in preventing and managing health conditions um, and improving our health and well-being. Um, low levels of physical activity or inactivity drives disease development and, and that mechanism is um, in a diagram to the right, so it's from the Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine. Um, it's been described as a best buy for public health. Um, the CMO cites it as a miracle drug. Um, so something isn't quite landing if we still have 25% of the population who are inactive. So why is it that the, the message that, we, that we're giving or the evidence with such strong evidence um, to the left there um, not being acted on on a daily basis? Um, 
Well, we have some big challenges to address, um, social, cultural, organisational norms. Um, so the first is um, for those, particularly those with living with um, a health condition, um, feel like physical activity is so, so far removed from something that they want to do necessarily or, or that sport and physical activity is, is normally the, the like or lever. The person that's going to a sports club regularly, it, for their self-identity is so far removed from what an active person is. Um, and we've conducted quite a lot of focus groups recently, and I'll explain why later. Um, but this feeling of not being able, so not having the capability psychologically um, and physically, or that perceived capability, um, is a big barrier for these individuals. Um, and not knowing what to do as well. Secondly, then, we have um, daily messages being given to us by the organisations that are then surrounding these individuals uh, and ourselves, um, whether that's through the media, um, through healthcare professionals, um, through carers, family, friends, um, that aren't necessarily, again, landing. They're not as effective. The physical activity message isn't as effective as we want it to be. Um, and this is often, um, for many the credible are credible trusted sources lastly then sport and physical activity opportunities so how can we better support people to be active in a way that's right for their individual circumstance um and we we've uh, th- this column has changed quite a few times because we end up talking about the sport and physical activity sector um, and we fe- forget about a lot of the self-directed activity unsupervised activity that people do that one of the highest things uh, in terms of activity types people do in this country is is walking and cycling um as well as fitness activities and things within their own their own home um, so that's why we were just really clear here that we're not just talking about structured, formal, supervised activity. This is about getting people to move more in a way that's right for them and their condition. Um, lastly, those arrows there are the um, interaction between the health system, health sector, um, and the sport and physical activity sector. Um, and at the moment, uh, it's fair to say that it's not seamless. Um, when individuals are recommended or referred or prescribed into activity, um, it's not always a seamless journey. Um, there, is, there are friction points that make it a little bit harder. Um, and when we're thinking about those barriers um, for the individual themselves, that's going to only make things worse if we don't make things easy and simple for people. So that's the current position that we're in. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples uh, of um, these kind of misconceptions that we need to start to challenge to bring it to life, And it's worth saying here that this is for illustrative purposes. Um, We have uh, come across through our work some very ingrained thoughts about exercise and people with um, health conditions. Uh, And just to say a couple of them. So people living with a health condition should only be signposted into condition-specific exercise. Uh, All people living with a health condition should and want to seek expert condition-specific advice before getting active. Um, and we, we've, we've even set up a system, uh, our qualifications, uh, our structures, messages that reinforce these very assumptions. Um, so we've got to this point now where we feel like we need to really start to change how we think and respond to these challenges um, and, and challenge the status quo. So just to go into a bit of a deep dive on one area we felt was a really big opportunity... Uh, for change, and that was working with healthcare professionals. Um, there are, uh, I think, stats vary, um, but at least 600,000 uh, healthcare professionals uh, in the country, and um, one in 10 people visiting GP every week, 1.2 people, uh, million people visiting a pharmacy every single day for health um, reasons. And um, for many, healthcare professionals are the trusted voice. Um, but unfortunately, the reality is um, physical activity is not part of the medical curriculum in, in a really meaningful way. Um, for example, in a more recent survey, over half, GP, half the GPs um, admitted um, to having no specific training on physical activity. Um, secondly, then, our CMO physical activity guidelines, um, only one in five... Um, in a recent survey were broadly or very familiar 
with the physical activity guidelines. Um, and that's not just limited to GPs. So there was also a recent study done um, with physios, and we've got Anna here today, um, which um, showed that only 16% knew all three elements of the CMO guide, physical activity guidelines as well. Um, healthcare professionals do not feel confident discussing physical activity. So again, in the survey, 44% only 44% were confident in actually raising physical activity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so it's, not, it's therefore not particularly surprising that it's not yet the norm. It's not something that is the go-to at the moment. Um, physical activity is, is, not, um, is being underused. Um, so that's why we're working with Public Health England um, and other partners to support healthcare professionals um, to increase their awareness, skills, improve their confidence in having the ability to raise physical activity um, on a day-to-day basis so incorporating it into uh, clinical practice. The programme's been designed based on where we think the big opportunities are. So it's looked across training, um, looking at both primary and secondary care. Um, looking at influencing the curriculum, so thinking about all those healthcare professionals that are actually being trained at the moment, um, looking at postgrad um, education, and, and also a bit of a big, big focus on continu- continuing professional development as well. So that's again a mix of online resources, face to face training, uh, primary and secondary care, testing areas where we need further development or evidence base, um, and, and also looking at it from two lenses so what are the national resources that everybody should be able to access and also testing a number of things in local places as well so thinking through and much like the example we've just had how can we incorporate and embed um, within a place considering the very complex um, health landscape Um, So I won't attempt to describe all of the areas of the programme, um, but just to give you a flavour, so our clinical champion um, training is peer-to-peer training from healthcare professionals around physical activity, um, who then deliver cascade training, so they deliver more physical activity, more of their peers across the country. Um, And the second one, which I'm going to go into more detail, is moving medicine. So... Um, the movement medicine was developed by the Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine, who have already um, been mentioned this morning. Um, they were asked to develop a clinician-facing resource on physical activity in the treatment and management of, of clinical conditions. And um, this was in response to the fact that many healthcare professionals know and recognise the importance of physical activity, um, but felt that the conversations weren't particularly rewarding. So often they felt they raised it, and sometimes it would even get to a point where there, it, it felt like conflict with the, with the patient. Um, it wasn't considered a priority, particularly with um, the limited amount of time that healthcare professionals have um, with a patient, and um, felt that they lacked the confidence and had no system support as well. So this is, uh, this is online, this is a website that you can access. Um, it was launched by Matt Hancock, our Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, in October last year. Um, it's already had 26,500 visitors, um, and we've had a lot of um, international interest in, in the resource as well. Um, the topics on the uh, online resource are very broad. Um, the most viewed topics are um, MSK, cancer and depression, um, and you also might be interested to see what's under, under development as well. So how was it developed? Um, the faculty did an excellent job. Um, they developed it using a knowledge inter- interaction framework with over 300 um, professionals. So they looked at what the evidence base was out there, and they consulted with, um, uh, with, health, with the health pro- uh, sorry, professional bodies, expert partners, health charities, to really understand what the evidence base was and distill it into something that was then a usable tool for individuals. So there's a list of all conditions. Um, there's um, things like how do you raise, uh, how do you actually raise physical activity? Some more of the kind of behaviour change support elements, uh, and looks at how can you raise it within one minute, five minutes, ten minutes. Understanding that there's obviously going to be uh, variable in terms of the amount of time that's available. Um, It combines the evidence base for physical activity and the behaviour change element so that we can improve the quality of the conversations that are being had between the healthcare professional and the patient. So when I say it was developed um, with lots of partners, everyone loves slides with lots of logos on, don't they? Um, You always get one. Um, So this is um, 
the whole range of partners that were worked with to develop um, the, the website, as I mentioned, it's a whole range from professional bodies through to, to royal colleges. Um, so I'd really encourage you to have a look at that website um, and hopefully there's something on there that would be of use to you um, or others. Um, another partnership I just wanted to share um, very briefly um, is that with uh, the Royal College of General Practitioners. So this is a membership uh, body of 52,000 GPs. Um, we have with them, um, and it is live, uh, but officially launching this week or next week, it's still um, to be confirmed, um, but it's a, a physical activity and lifestyle toolkit um, for practices we are encouraging and working with them to share, to encourage practices to share best practice amongst um, each other. And that's looking at everything from how they embed physical activity into the practice, looking at how um, you can evaluate and um, consider and share patient outcomes and, and how you get the most effective patient outcomes, uh, providing C- uh, PD opportunities through webinars, podcasts, um, promoting movie medicine, which is a free resource, and also the launch of a active practice charter. So this is an accreditation system. So active practices will be rewarded and recognised um, when they are meeting five pillars. Um, which include things like increasing um, the physical activity levels of staff members, increasing physical activity levels of patients, um, and also partnering with uh, local opportunities as well, such as Parkrun um, or um, Walking for Health. So going back to the three big challenges um, that I mentioned earlier, just wanted to share a very exciting piece of work we've been uh, working on for the last couple of years, um, which is really looking at that that first column, um, but we hope it will also have a ripple effect on the other areas as well, um, which is around messaging. So it's, um, it's felt that at the moment there isn't a unified message around physical activity coming from... Um, health charities. So we have been working with uh, so a collaboration of 16 of the leading health and social care charities. Um, they represent um, the 15 million people in England that are, um, are living with or um, are at risk of developing a health condition. They have significant reach. Um, they are trusted, recognised, credible um, charities and um, we will be launching in September uh, alongside uh, and fronted by, I should say, um, the charities, uh, a national campaign to support those with long-term conditions to get active and challenge that misconception that it's not for them. Um, So watch this space for that in September. It will be on your TVs, and we're... um, If any of you are familiar with our This Girl Can campaign, we are pitching it at the same level as that in terms of scale. So... Watch your space. Thank you very much. Hi, it's Desiree Chapel here and the Top Med Talk team. I hope you're staying safe during these times. We wanted to say thank you for downloading Top Med Talk. This piece is not specific to the COVID-19 crisis, but we are covering it daily. If you want more of that information, you can find it on topmedtalk.com. Now, in the meantime, we are continuing to champion perioperative medicine like we always have done. And we're working with our academic partners as the crisis continues to bring you our normal scheduled content. We also want to say thank you to our sponsors, specifically Edwards Life Sciences, for their generous support. I hope you enjoy this podcast.